Hello everybody, you're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Town. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we head over to the Rye Zone for a short story and or some poetry, and we catch up with Twanglin Jack Ford over in the Yorkshed for a weekly album review. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for the Arch on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we are repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. Uh, you can also email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. So this week we're going to be chatting, uh, we're having a quick catch-up show. Of, we're going to be chatting to Charles F. Rosenay, author of the book of Top 10 Beatles lists, as well as J.V. Hilliard, author of the Warminster series. Both of them previous guests, so it's just going to be a short catch-up to see what's new with them. But before we do that, we're going to head over to the Rye Light Zone for some more poetry from a previous guest, Charles Heathcote. These are some poems from his collection, Shepherd's Delight. Hi everyone, my name is Charlie, and today I thought that I would read you some of my poetry. Now, don't rush away too quickly. I know that a lot of people get very worrisome when they hear the word poetry. Indeed, when I released my collection, Shepherd's Delight, last year, people who had previously read and said they enjoyed all of my books would give me that knowing smile and put the book down because they just weren't interested in poetry or so they thought and since today is world poetry day at least i believe it is i thought that we could share in some poems shepherd's delight is a collection that was about eight years in the making i know that the first poem that i'm going to read and the one that prompted the collection ovine gynecology was written in 2014 for a competition which i was long listed in when i wrote this first poem it really snowballed into me every now and then writing poems about my family about my agricultural background the facts that whilst i come from a long line of farmers I have no interest in the profession myself. Indeed, it's very difficult for me to want to farm because I have a deep-seated disdain for mud. I just really don't like getting muddy hands. Actually, I don't like getting anything on my hands. If I get the tiniest modicum of dirt or something that just feels wrong, I have to wash them immediately. I should probably get that checked out. Anyway, I will begin with the poem that prompted this entire collection. I apologise to anybody with a sensitive stomach. I know that this poetry collection was gifted to somebody on Christmas Day who promptly came and told me they like the poetry but I did put them off their Christmas dinner. So this is Ovine Gynecology. The U has its readout. Dad says to press the hot mass of pink flesh back inside. My fingers squelch against the steaming conical force each fold of rigid flesh into the sheep's darkness. Dizzy from bending down for so long, I wonder when I will get to wash my hands or if lunch will be eaten with the worry of E. coli. Dad stitches a truss to her back end, both farmer and physician, yet still she complains, bleats and heaves herself as though we've inconvenienced her. This cold April morning, where the white balances off and sheep hide in bushes, birth lambs with crowns of gorse, and all sound leaves the world save for lowing and cackles. This is the real beauty of spring. The sheep rule this empire, where crows bide their time as lambs frolic. A clan of wool trailing prolapses that is his hour penance to fix. And I've talked about that before. I have... When I was younger, Easter used to be the time when we were off school and, and farming children would be out helping their parents to lamb the sheep. At least that is supposedly the role of the child. For me, it often meant sitting in the Land Rover reading John Steinbeck as a teenager or being up the field playing Power Rangers when I was much younger. I should have done those sequentially, but whatever. I oftentimes found myself either stood in a entryway to block the sheep from going down there. I was basically a gate because otherwise I was no use in ornament. And holding in all of the, these sheep's prolapses that year is what made me say, no, no more. I don't want to farm anymore. An ancestor of mine had the opposite 
thing happen. They were somebody who worked for the butchers. The poem that I'm about to read describes the event that saw them decide that they were going to give up butchery and heading to farming. And, you know, I like that I was the converse of that. This poem here is entitled The Butcher's Boy. The butcher's boy rides his bicycle through Bollington. He brings cuts of meat in brown paper packages, knocks at the door of Mrs. Ollinshead. She has a craving for proper pork sausages. The butcher's boy rides his bicycle through Bollington. Not that he wants to, but it pays good wages. He wants to roam wild moors, shepherd sheep, to comb the woods alongside his collie. The butcher's boy is tossed from his bicycle in Bollington when a tractor passes and knocks him into a verge. He has scrapes on his hands, smashes his collarbone, and the driver just laughs as he heads back to the hills. The boy brings his bicycle back to the butcher, scowls his way past a queue of mad customers, tells the butcher to sod his black pudding and keep the bike. He can deliver his own pissing tripe. The butcher's boy that was mentioned in that poem is my dad's dad. And he used to own then subsequently rent, due to some familial drama that we don't need to get into here, a farm on the Cat and Fiddle Road. And upon his death, this ended up being sold. About 10 years afterwards, there was a fire after this family had spent a lot of money refurbishing and renovating this old farmhouse, because admittedly there were no modern amenities when my grandparents had had it. This poem is about a journey up there, and I think the ways in which we consider places our own or our families when we are children and having to almost navigate that those are no longer our spaces. So this is entitled Long Clough. We drive up the cat and fiddle to a stone farm track the old fellow won't tarmac so that the Land Rover jolts, clatters, sprays pebbles at the paintwork. We cross the fields, grass as pale as ashes, Thin black reeds grope from beneath the earth, damned demons pleading for salvation, reaching towards a sky full of clouds, mist white, where buzzards dance with crows, fight with gulls for dominance, for the slim pickings of a fresh dead lamb. Moles poke fun at us, poke noses from their hills, the ultimate kamikaze mission, if the birds don't get them, dad will. And rabbits dig their holes beside badger sets. Their pockmarks and craters are acne scars upon this prehistoric skin. A chimney smokes up ahead. Perhaps Nana Alice is burning a tree again, its trunk filling the living room. There are no fire hazards in a Macclesfield forest. We reach the swamp, a farmyard of knee-deep mud, where old cars go to die, their parts Frankensteined onto other faulty machines. The thick stench of cow muck crams itself down our throats as we enter the shipping, the last leg of this quest. Through darkness, where the shadows of old equipment spread fear, pace quickens at the sight of a scythe. Strange to think that I will no longer make this journey, that the farm is not ours, it's somebody else's dream up in flames. From there, you will have seen mention of my dad, who was also mentioned in the first poem, and I think that he is actually a big presence within the poetry collection because obviously he's the parent who farms. He's the one who came from the farming background. And I think that throughout the poetry, I end up discussing his life and perhaps the differences between our own lives. You know, I'm very much um, <laughs> the townie and... As much as I enjoy the countryside and love walking around it and just can feel at peace there, there is no part of me that wishes to go and enter into that back-breaking world of agriculture, which is so heavily maligned by people. And there is, I think, a forgetfulness that the people who farm actually... Might not necessarily have any other option, but that's a story for another day. This next poem I'm reading because it is a tale that has become one of those family myths. It's one of those legends that gets brought up every now and then. And when I first told my dad that I'd put this in the collection, he said, you're going to have me getting arrested. Then I read Seamus Heaney's collection a few months ago, was that Death of a Naturalist, and he'd written a poem about something similar, and both of those things have linked in my mind. I think his is a lot worse than this one. 
is called Numeracy Lessons 1964. He learns to count at Longclough, drowning kittens in a water bowels at a favour to his mother. If there are any cats left in the yard when I get home, you're in for a clout. He hangs them on the clothesline, dripping onto the dry stone. The dogs worry at the brittle kitten carcasses. His mum returns on the Winkle bus, says she was only messing. <laughs> and I, I really think that that just says it all, really. Those are some poems by Charles Heathcote from his collection Shepherd's Delight for this week's entry into the Rylight Zone. You're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Fabulous Parfait with their version of Chandelier. Sweet. Body girls, don't get hurt, can't feel anything. When will I learn? I push it down, push it down. I'm the one for a good time, cold phones blowing up, the ringing my doorbell. I feel the love, feel the love. One, two, three, one, two, three, drink. One, two, three, one, two, three, drink. One, two, three, one, two, three, drink. Throw him back to Larus
That was What If by Bitterroot, and before that we had Fabulous Parfait with Chandelier. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to be joined by Charles F. Rosenay for a little bit of a catch-up. Um, basically, to kick things off, the, the big question is, what have you been up to since last time we spoke? So last time we chatted, uh, it was around about the time the uh, the book of uh, top, the top 10 Beatles book came out. Um, yes. What have you been up to since then? Well, the top 10 uh, Beatles list book was really successful. I'm still working it, still doing conventions and libraries and promoting that alongside my book of top 10 horror lists, which are mm. companion books. But the Turtles compendium that came out since then, uh, it just heads and tails above the previous things, which were just pretty much compilations. This is a serious 500 pound <laughs> monster of a book which for people who love the Turtles and love uh, Happy Together and all the songs they put out and realize that there's so much more than the, the one-hit wonder that people mm -hmm. only know, uh, it's it's an important piece of, um, I think, um, music uh, literature. And I think it, our goal, if it could ever happen, is for to get, get them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's, mm -hmm. that's our goal. Besides that, I'm working on two, one other book with Mark Arnold, who is the co-author on the Turtles book, and uh, and a book for two, three years from now. But it's hard to ju juggle the writing of the books because, as you know, I produce conventions stateside. I do mm -hmm. Beatle tours to Liverpool every summer, and I do Dracula tours to Transylvania every Halloween. So I'm a yeah. busy, busy guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, then when I was chatting to Mark, he said he, he'll be coming over for the next Beatles tour as well. So when when is that? That's uh, actually this coming uh, August over B Bank Holiday. It's during Beatle Week in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. um, we leave the States on August 19th and then uh, come back on the 28th of August. So we spend 10 days of visiting London, then Henley, and then Liverpool for a whole week. Awesome. Henley's right by me, actually. So that's quite that's quite cool. I live a couple of miles, a couple of towns over. Oh, we'll have to meet. They have a great bazaar in the center of town uh, yeah. on the day we're there. I think it's the Thursday. Yeah, the Thursday when we come over. So um, we take people, you know, to the estate. They can see from the gate John Lennon's uh, John Lennon, George Harrison's uh, Friar yeah. Park. And then we uh, go through the town. You know, he drank at the Angel, so some people stop there. Um, they go across the street at the church where Dusty Springfield, um, you know, is, is uh, well, not buried, but I guess cremated in her mo mm -hmm. monument. Is there. And then we go to the bazaar and have lunch, and then it's off to Liverpool. It's sort of a, like an in-betweener. Yeah. Awesome. So um, one of the things I chatted to about uh, Mark, to chat with Mark about was how, you know, you got the Beatles, the monkeys, the turtles, they've all got these animal themed names. And I wondered, yeah. have you got any insight into, into why that is and why it's why it's fallen out of fashion? Well, I'll tell you something I remember and I don't know where I read it, but I remember mom telling me uh, when I was a little kid that, <clears throat> you know, some of the Motown acts and the black bands that were coming out were trying to not be animals. So they would mm. be temptations and they would be supreme and they would be marvelettes, which were all really cool, you know, uh, high flying names as opposed to the animals, the birds, mm. the bees. I guess maybe it was just a, a, a genre thing. If you were, you know, a pop band on Want to Get Hits on AM Radio when you were white, you would do all those yeah. animal things. And if you were, you know, a uh, 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 soul or Motown or R&B, yeah, you wanted to have like maybe a little classier look and a higher uh, echelons, and it would be uh, those kind of names. Uh, but I don't know why uh, all those groups, maybe because when the Beatles hit and one is a success, yeah. they all want to be. Or maybe they were all influenced by, you know, Buddy Holly and the Crickets. That was probably yeah. the start of it all. Yeah. Well, and I suppose as well, you know, you do you do have that like genre by genre. So, you know, with rap music, you've got a lot of rappers who are Lil something. So like Lil John, Lil Wayne, uh, Lil Nas X, all of that, all of that. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think Mark said as well with uh, with the Turtles, um, I'm all right thinking they were originally they originally had a different name and then they became the Turtles because I think it was a manager or something said that then people would associate them with the Beatles and, you know, with yeah. the, the British British invasion. Sure, and it made sense. Um, I think one of them always quotes and says, we missed being the Beatles 
by three letters and and five billion dollars or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they were originally um, a surf band. You know, they would do uh, instrumentals. They would do beach kind of music, uh, like D uh, Dick Dale and all that. Um, but yeah, they turned to the, the Turtles to to obviously capitalize on that um, Beatles invasion and the British invasion and that pop sound. Yeah. And what is it about the turtles that you know drew you to to writing about them? I mean, there's no shortage of acts you could have picked. Yeah. Um, so I I contend that you know there's only a handful of bands that are seriously severely missing from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it's the Monkees, it's the Turtles, uh, and then you know the the list goes on from there with Three Dog Night and, and perhaps um, Paul Revere of the Raiders. And you think about it, it's all these bands that had hit after hit after hit on AM radio. And for some reason, it doesn't get the respect that a band does if it sold, you know, some albums or influenced other acts, but didn't necessarily have the hits. You know, there mm -hmm. should be two categories, maybe one hit makers and then uh, influencers. I don't know. But, you know, the monkeys should fit in both because they were yeah. hit makers and influencers. The Turtles, I think, uh, mostly because Happy Together is one of those songs that's just part of our DNA. You hear it in, you still hear it in movies and TV shows and ads and everywhere. And everyone knows it. Every generation mm -hmm. knows it. Whether they know it's the Turtles or not is another story. But then they don't know what's the next hit and the third hit. And, and you know, there's a dozen hits. Now, besides all that, it's, uh, it's great stuff by the guys, Flo and Eddie, the two lead singers, who then went on to do vocals in other acts, you know, Mark yeah. Boland, T-Rex, and, and Springsteen. And again, the list continues. And then they were, uh, you know, in Frank Zappa's band. So there's so much of them, I think, that wasn't known, that we felt was such a missing element in the rock and roll history, that the people who knew the Turtles and knew Mark and, and Howard knew those elements, but the rest of the world didn't. So we felt yeah. there was really need for that book and when we and we, when we got into the deep dive and when we went into it i as someone who knew most of their hits fell in love with them even more by hearing all this stuff that was so great one song sounds like the beach boys the next one sounds like it could have been the raspberries the next yeah. one is beatlesque and i didn't know that so in my discovery of it it even gave me more impetus to share this book with others so that they would you know discover uh how how cool and how great and how awesome this uh turtles band was yeah well mark was saying when i chatted to him as well i think that didn't they have one album where they did you know, each song was a different genre. And then uh, later on in the career that, you know, they were doing like, um, you know, music aimed at children and stuff. And so there's a lot of different genres they touched on. As, as you said, they started off as like a surf band as well. Um, I mean, I can't think of many other bands. The, the only thing that I can think of with somebody who's kind of touched on as many different genres is probably Weird Al. Um, but, you know, can you think of any anyone else that's similar to the Turtles in how, how much ground they've covered with the genres they've, you know, played with? But, uh, I'm glad you mentioned Weird Al because I love acts and, you know, Weird Al is the, the farthest on that spectrum of comedy, but I love acts that give us great music, you know, pop tunes that stay in your head, give us some personality and give us comedy. Well, that's the Beatles. That's the mm. monkey. And that's the turtles. And, uh, you know, those three elements were what always attracted me to certain acts. I saw Bette Midler in concert and said, oh, my God, I walked away loving the show so much because every song was great because she had so much personality and she was hysterical. People in the yeah. crowd were, were peeing their pants laughing at her, her routines. And, you know, there's so many bands who I love who I'll go see and it's either no, no for no perfect or you don't re even recognize the songs. And yeah. I'm walking away and saying, I would have liked if they said hello to the crowd, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I respect their musicianship, but that's not a show to me. A show is a show. And I, I guess, yeah. you know, like being an entertainer, being a showman myself, you know, everything I do, I try to incorporate comedy. I try to really put my energy and my personality and everything. And there's not a lot of bands that have done that. And Weird Al certainly, you know, is, is from the comical end of things and personality and musical and all that, you know, perhaps not the originality. But the big other distinct thing about the Turtles is they, they play their own stuff. 
Yeah. They were on a, this dinky label that couldn't afford to hire in Hal Blaine <laughs> and all the wrecking crew. So they were putting out their own uh, bass lines and drumming themselves. And that was so rare for the time. And just yeah. based on, you know, as much as we love the Herman's Hermits and the Beach Boys and Mamas and the Papas go on and on and on. They're not playing every note on every song, but the yeah. turtle, the turtles did. Big thank you to Charles F. Rosany for joining us for a little bit of a catch up. You're listening to the Archwell 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain, and this is Big Nose Thomas with Bell Ringing Daddy. <laughs> Bell Ringing Daddy by Big Nose Thomas. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for another catch up. This is uh, us catching up with previous guest, uh, fantasy author JB Hilliard. Uh, I can't remember when we last had you on. Uh, it was very early on. You were one of the first ever guests that we had on, I think. So we're probably talking two, maybe three years. I think uh, your first book had come out. So what have you been up to since then? Well, book one, two, three are out and on the marketplace and book four comes out in August of this year. So as folks watch this, they will be the book four echoes of Ghostwood will be available uh, to them. And then uh, beyond that, I've licensed the intellectual property uh, of the series uh, based on its relative popularity to uh, an augmented reality and virtual reality game company here in the States that are going to turn it into an AR VR game in 2026. And then I'm in discussions with a studio in Florida 
uh, to turn it into a graphic novel series and an adaptation there. That's TBD. I've got a couple of nice, cool slides that, you know, um, folks have put together, um, kind of showing me the, the direction of it in the new medium, which is a lot of fun. But when we first spoke a few years ago, that's right. I, I would have never imagined I was at this platform mm. uh and uh, in this position so it's, it's glad to be back and update everybody on i appreciate the opportunity to do that no 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 thanks for coming on and i mean i know one of the things that you've you've kind of focused on here and there throughout throughout your career has been to go to uh conventions and things like that uh, obviously when we when we talked last time i think it was in the middle of covid so everything had shut down have you been able to get out and about with the books and to go on tour and that sort of thing at all I have, you know, you know, that's likely the best place for me to be. I, I've I've gone to libraries, book clubs, uh, you know, used bookstores, new bookstores, uh, but the best place for me is the convention circuit. Uh, and I learned that last year, uh, really trying my hand through a five series uh, convention circuit called Galaxy Con, which is mm -hmm. a liken to a, a Comic Con, except. You know, it may not be in New York City or San Diego or Chicago. These are going to be in smaller cities. Uh, but I've done the tour of Richmond, Raleigh, Columbus, et cetera, places like that here in the States. And you, they still turn out anywhere between 35 and 65,000 people. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you when you go and you're there for three or four days, uh, you're really in front of a target rich environment. You know, this is yeah. a place where you get a bunch of nerds and geeks together that like to read my kind of, you know, fantasy adventure stuff. And it makes it easier to pitch. People get it. You don't have to spend time explaining to them about the genre uh, and what it, what epic fantasy means, what dark fantasy mm. means. It's more, uh, you know, they they get it um, and they're drawn in by the cover, the blurb, the the story, and the pitch. And I don't mind pitching. You know, I know many authors mm. have a tendency to be introverted and don't like that one on one interaction, but I've never had a problem doing that. So I enjoy actually energizes me and gets me yeah. excited to get into the next thing. And and so. You know, I'm hoping that here by the end of the of the year, as I finish out the, the Galaxy Con tour and start to grow into some larger tours in 2025, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that momentum continues. It's, but it's been a lot of fun. I enjoy doing that. Yeah. Well, I suppose as well, you know, with some of the smaller conventions, again, when you're, when you're not doing a big major city comic con, um, you, you also don't have the same competition and you're not up there competing against, you know, the big boys and, uh, you know, the big franchises and things like that. Um, so I guess that kind of helps as well. Um, but also you mentioned, so you mentioned the, the video game, uh, or well, the VR game coming out, um, and you've got the graphic novel that you're in, um, you know, talks with, is that part of your plan to kind of, I guess, make it more approachable a bit like with Lord of the Rings, you know, back in the day, it was, there was just the books and you had the people who read the books and then that was about it. And then obviously with all the video games, all the movies come out, it's been able to take it to a new level of popularity with people who might not necessarily read the books, but who still kind of consume the, the property. So is that your goal with, with the Warminster books? It is. Uh, you know, I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, there are a lot of folks out there that like to read, but there are just as many folks that are gamers or folks that like comic books and graphic mm -hmm. novels. And it's just a different medium. Uh, now, that does involve a lot of storyboarding and you have to seed some level of, you know, artistic control. Mm -hmm. What I learned right away is as I started going through it, I was, I was on the sideline, you know, it was, you know, me basically giving them guardrails to stay within. Yeah. Uh, but it's a different medium, right? I don't know it. And, and in a game, you can go in a hundred different directions where a novel is very linear. A graphic mm -hmm. novel is very linear. And so, I'm dictating the pace. I'm dictating the direction. Where here you could play a character that's working with the villains, right, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. So they they, it's an entirely different um, way of approaching it. But it does, like you said, open up the door to folks that may not be aware of it any other way. And if they were to read the books, it gives them a little bit of a cheat code for the game. Or if they were to read the books, they would enjoy perhaps you know its adaptation to a graphic novel uh, series. Because I I think and, and I know you've read them. You know, I think that the, the books are, are very illustrative. I think they're very visual mm -hmm. and I think they will lend themselves well to both the, these new forms of media, you know, as, as they get there, um, you know, but there's no guaranteed level of success with that either. So it's it's just a mm -hmm. lot of fun, uh, but it's also um, it, not frustrating, but, you know, it, it, it w without being the one who's driving the car, you're kind of a passenger watching everybody yeah. else do the work and it's it's a little nervy, but you know, other than that, it's, it's, it's been, it's been fun and I've learned a lot from it. 
Yeah. Well, I suppose to an extent, I mean, it must be a bit like when you've worked with your cover designers on the books where it's like you give them the, again, you give them the concepts that you like, and then it's kind of, you know, you got to rely on them to do their thing. So did that act as kind of almost like a practice run for what you're doing now where you're having to give away, I guess, more creative control? Yeah. You know, I think our mutual friend, Larch Gallagher, has been in incredible at designing the uh, the, the covers. I, I don't have that kind of talent. I'm nowhere near mm. that kind of talent, but she's been really like a, you know, a police sketch artist. You know, you give mm. her, you know, 80% of what you expect and, and it comes back and it's usually pretty close. And then you're just really cleaning up around the edges and yeah. making the cover look the way you want it to or, or, or whatever. And the other thing I've learned from the process is what's on the cover doesn't necessarily have to be on the book. It just has to be mm. something that's going to drag people to the book to pick it up, to flip it over, read the blurb, maybe read the first chapter and then decide whether or not they want to buy it if they're in a bookstore. Uh, but the, the covers do have to be catchy and the ways that she's designed them, they look like they belong in a box set. They look mm. like they're going to pull you through a series. Uh, and I, and I think that it's been, you know, for me, that was the first step in that learning curve. Cause you're right. I mean, I, I didn't know what that was going to be like, um, and you, you kind of have to have faith and take that leap of faith and turning yourself over to uh, somebody that has that talent and understand that's what they mm. do and let it go. And, and, and she's been great to work with. Yep. Awesome. Cool. And, um, you mentioned again, the idea of with the, with the, with the app, you'll be able to, you know, play both sides. It's a bit more kind of open world. Like is that, cause I know, I know a lot of the inspiration for the books came from, uh, playing D and D. And I mean, are there similarities between working on the app and working on a D and D campaign? Because I guess it's similar with D and D is you've got an idea as a dungeon master. This is what the storyline is and what I hope people do. But people can go off and do their own thing. You know, people can refuse the call to adventure and just stay in the tavern if they want to. That's right. You know, and that's that's exactly what it's like. It's it's almost as if the game it's you know it's open source. It's no longer me in control of it. Uh, and you're like that as a dungeon master. You tr you hope to set up a a campaign for your adventurers who want to be part of it and follow the storyline, but it never goes that linearly. And so there's always a left turn or a right turn somewhere, um, you know, and you, so I, I think watching the coders and watching the storyboarders and going through the process on that side of what that's really like, I think has really, you know, been eye opening for me because you're right. I mean, th that was some of the first questions out of the gate is what happens if, someone makes a character that wants mm. to help the villains or what happens if they just want to own property in the land and become their own Lord and really kind of just meet characters along the way. They have the right to do that. They can gain skills and they can mm. earn magic and they can do their own quests without it having to be directly connected to the storyline. And so they've had to, and I've had to give them a wide berth to do that. And I think that, yeah. um, you know, that's, you know, it, it's, it's been interesting, uh, fun, maybe, yeah, but more interesting because you just get nervous about it. You want to make sure that, that it stays along the, the path that you want it to go, but yeah, you can't guarantee that in gameplay. So, but you're right. I mean, D and D has been a real big inspiration for the Warminster saga, as well as, you know, I, I think all the gamers that are out there that both mm -hmm. game and are also playing tabletop, you know, I think that's kind of fun to, to see that transition. Yeah. Well, I suppose the genre, the genre itself is very, you know, D and D and, and fantasy go hand in hand, really. It's, it's the same as how you can't really talk about fantasy without talking about Tolkien at some point, because it's the sort of so interweaved together, you know? Yeah. Well, he's the grandfather of it all. And if it were not for J.R.R. Tolkien, there would not be fantasy. There would not mm. be, you know, D and D's as we know it. And you're right. I mean, the, what D and D's done is it's allowed you to use your imagination to play in a world that you would only have a tendency to read about, uh, mm -hmm. and now you get a chance to experience it from your own uh, point of view. Uh, and I think that that and what Gygax and others have done since then in the tabletop role playing game uh, arena has allowed people to do that. And I think with the advent of AR and VR, we're going to get closer and closer where you're going to be able to do more of that. Mm -hmm. We've even seen that over the last ten years, where people were forced to play with one another in person. Now, you know, at first it was Skype, but now it's Zoom. Mm -hmm. And now there's there are accessories out there that allow you to game and even roll online. You could be anywhere yeah, playing with anyone line, around yeah. the country. Yeah. And it's and it's just a lot of fun. It's the next generation of the game. Uh, but the minute you slip on some goggles and you're able to play your character and you're looking at the other characters mm -hmm. and the the enemies within, uh, you know, that's gonna be a lot of fun too. And that will also 
I think change the landscape and and we're not that far away from that, but yep. hopefully we'll see it in our lifetimes. But for now, I think that I'm, I'm pretty happy doing what I do and it, and it, and it spurs imagination and allows you, if you, if you memorialize that and capture that, mm. I, I think that allows you to, to, to write some pretty good novels. Yeah. And, uh, you know, speaking of that, so what's, what's next for you? Let's say we catch up again in another two, three years, where do you hope to be and what do you hope to have achieved? Well, I have, uh, for the, following year my plan is to write three books two of the three of which have already started the third as you know is in process uh and the idea behind them is to provide origin stories for the more popular characters mm -hmm. uh in the in the in the series uh once though those release that will give me about a year's time to work the back scene to put together the next trilogy which will be the follow-up to the warminster saga really getting into what happens after and there's going to be about a seven year gap between mm -hmm. the end of book four and the beginning of book two, which will also be released in 2026. And the goal is to connect the release of the game, the release of the graphic novel, and then the release of the new series all in 2026. And, and that yeah. would be a hopefully a really big year and, and a landmark year for the for the series and for the realm as a whole. Yeah. Awesome. Big thank you to JV Hilliard for joining me. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Broken Colours with Gamble. I have it in my grasp I have most things I acquire For a simple man I have most things on my list That'll make me feel complete But the one thing that I want Tips to move your feet 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 You better keep on fighting Walking down that valley with no safe point inside But nothing's gonna happen with you by my side And nothing's gonna happen with you by my side Whoa. When I think of all the gigs I've played 
When I think of all the bands I've seen It's like I'm living a wish I once made And things could be better, things could get worse And we all could be dancing in a rock and roll universe It may be a blessing, it may be a curse We all could be dancing in a rock and roll universe That was Rock and Roll Universe by Twangling Jack Ford. Before that, we had Gamble by Broken Colours. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Welcome Sound. I'm your host, Ian Cobain. And it's time for us to go over to the Oak Shed now to catch up with, if I can get my words out, Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. The Planets by Host, an album I bought from the Rennie Gove charity shop in Flatwell Heath. This is an LP on the Classics for Pleasure label released in 1976 meaning it would have cost one pound, and it would have sold like hotcakes. It would have been given a prominent display in Woolworths, along with big war themes, Dr Zhivago, and the Top of the Pops covers albums. It is interesting that they used the futuristic Tomorrow's World font, that now looks so dated. It is very much classical music for those that don't like classical music. Each track is named after a planet, and the music is given the attributes of the mythical deity that gave that planet its name. So it kicks off with Mars, the bringer of war, a violent, brooding marching piece. When I announced on Facebook that this album was on my list, a fellow musician from the Bellevue Jams said I should point out that to make the strings sound more violent, they are not bowed but hit with the wooden side of the bow. The other big tune is Jupiter, the bringer of joy. This has the big melody that became the hymn I vow to thee my country. It has tunes to lift the hairs of Englishmen of my generation, not just because of the hymn setting, but because of the song Joybringer, which was a hit for Manfred Mann, using the other big melody from the piece. And the added bonus for me is that Frank Zappa inevitably used the third tune. 
in his song Call Any Vegetable. Mars and Jupiter are very much the stars of the piece, but Venus, the bringer of peace, does have a peaceful pastoral quality. Saturn, the bringer of old age, is a bit bleak, and Neptune, the mystic, does sound a bit woo-woo, with a female choir going a bit Star Trek. I should be careful what I say about Uranus, and I love what the sleeve notes say about it. Uranus comes in with a shocking fortissimo on trumpets and trombones, and a grotesque 6-4 dance. Or as I would put it, it's a bit wicker man. Gustav Holst, The Planets. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to JV Hilliard and Charles F. Rosany for joining me for a little catch-up. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. And we are repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. or on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcast. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. You can also reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is Scardinals with their cover of Too Much Too Young. I'll catch you next week. I'm